our, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Brett Kaysen, is the Vice President of Sustainability with National Pork Board, and I was just visiting with him. He's been here with Pork Board for three years now. There he was also, uh, while at Zoetis, a dairy production specialist, so it's nice to see those perspectives uh, bringing in from uh, another commodity. Uh, he used a lot of uh, data helping producers apply data and genomics to improve health and profitability on their dairies in Colorado and Kansas. So when it comes to talking about sustainability, I think there'll be a lot to add on uh, when we come to looking at uh, some of the data information that uh, he'll share. So be before joining Zoetis, Dr. Kaysen, as I mentioned, was uh, at Colorado State University in Fort Collins in the Animal Sciences Department, so brings a rich history in academics and the university uh, perspectives as well. Spent five years as interim undergraduate teaching coordinator and 13 years in various instructor positions, and I know several accolades while he was there uh, on, on the faculty and uh, staff. He uh, loves to contribute to a lot of youth uh, involvement as well, proud supporter of 4-H and his own children I know are uh, raising pigs and uh, traveling around uh, locally right now in the summertime uh, enjoying the uh, industry as young people. So he right, resides now down in Madison County and as I said is the sustainability director for Pork Board. He leads the organization's effort to, uh, to establish pork as a responsible protein of choice. He works to strengthen the food chain and consumer understanding of pork production practices by developing research-based communication strategies that engage and influence key decision makers. So, welcome, Brett. Thanks, Colin. I appreciate that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Boy, that wasn't real enthusiastic, but let's try again. Good afternoon. It's like my old teaching days. You didn't want to be the lecture as the day wore on, right? So uh, you guys, you folks started at like 8 in the morning, and now you're getting towards the end of the race. So I'll do the best I can to impart on some knowledge. I'll do the best I can to keep you engaged and also stay on time because I'm looking forward to your very astute questions towards the end. So we'll try to run up to the 3 o'clock hour and leave enough time for a discussion. So first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity to stand in front of you today. Uh, this is my first opportunity to ever attend this event. event. So uh, I had to work in the office this morning and came up this afternoon. My intentions for you today relative to this talk is this, is to give you an understanding of why the term sustainability should even matter to us as pig farmers or as pork as a food. And so we could spend three days parsing this topic out and for you young people in the room that I recognize that are students, there'll be an exam later and it will be essay based, just kidding. Um, but really the intention is, as you come into this room, I'm thinking that you may be saying, sustainability, I see the word. Okay, Dr. Kaysen, you're the vice president, Colin says, of sustainability. But if I could rewind the clock the last three years of my role, the most common question I always get is, Dr. Kaysen, can you please define sustainability for us? And one of the things I learned in my PhD defense is it's okay to say I don't know. Now, I'm not going to tell you I don't know today, but here's what I'm going to tell you is the definition determines on the business that you represent. So if you're Coca-Cola or Danone or the National Pork Board or Amazon, you define that word differently, and that's okay. Now, the hardcore scientist in me says, well, no way. There's got to be a true definition, and it's just not true. One of the things I challenge you with, though, is the definition that I really like is the definition which the United Nations has provided that says sustainability is serving the needs of those today without sacrificing the needs of future generations. So I'll say it again. Sustainability is meeting the needs of folks or the human capital today without sacrificing the needs of future generations. I think we can all rally around that. Actually, we've been doing that as pig farmers for a long time. That's the other point I want to make to you today is that this word may be new to a lot of people and it may be headline press. You can't hope or you can't help but open up a newspaper or if you're in the social space and see something on sustainability, right? But pig farmers have been doing sustainability since the beginning of time. We maybe have used different terms. Maybe it was stewardship. Maybe it was responsibility. Maybe it was a commitment to continuous improvement, right? It's the same thing. This is the word. This is the word that's used. And most importantly, as I was listening to your prior speaker say, you as farmers, who's your customer? And I agreed with them, but I'll take it one step forward. And this is what I challenge you producers in the room. Who's your ultimate customer is the eater. So you may sell your pigs to a packer, yes, and they may be your direct customer, 
But ultimately, who's consuming your product? The consumer. And the consumer today in 2021 looks much different than it did in 2020, looks much different than the black and white photo that the previous speaker showed you. So let's dig in. So what's the current landscape? Mike, you talked a little bit about this. Start with food. Start with the business of food. And think about this globally, because remember, pork is the number one consumed protein in the world. One in four people globally are moderately or severely food insecure. You mentioned that earlier, Mike. There are some folks that just can't get the protein that they need. And then we've got these cases of obesity that has tripled since 1975. So if I don't leave you with anything, when you depart these doors here in a moment, what I want you to understand is we have an opportunity in the pig business and pork as a food to be part of the solution. And one of the charges that I have to you and I have as a leader in the industry is we can look at sustainability as the next thing, the death by a thousand cuts, or we can embrace it and say, maybe there's a better opportunity to land on shared values and be part of the solution. So if there's a great population in the world or one in four people are food insecure, does pork play a role? Absolutely it does and it should. I call that, knock, 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 the steely-eyed capitalist in me, a business opportunity. And we should look at it that way. The other thing in terms of this obesity issue that we face, does pork play a role there as well? Absolutely, in a health and wellness play. Do you read that in popular press? No, it's the opposite, right? What do you read? If I eat red meat, it will kill me. It'll cause cancer. It'll do this. It'll do that. And actually, it's part of a balanced nutrition program. So we can be part of the solution from a nutritious world favorite choice. So let's talk about the world today. It forever changed. And I am really tired, to be honest with you, talking about COVID. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to the day where we can read it in the history book and not just talk about it all the time. I'm also looking forward to it that, like our, our house, if something goes wrong, like there's a water that's leaking in the barn, because of COVID, <laughs> right? I mean, everything's because of COVID. But what COVID dang sure did is it shined a big spotlight on the supply chain, right? And we read about and we heard about global pandemics, and you kind of thought, well, yeah, they're like the zombie apocalypse. Will it really happen? It happened, right? It happened, and it happened in a big way, and that woke people up. Your prior speaker talked about, you know, a shortage of toilet paper. Who'd ever thought, right? We were in the wrong business. I thought I should have started investing in, in uh, plexiglass as well. You know, it's still up. And zip strips, there was an opportunity missed, right? So it shined a big light on our supply chain, but it also shined the light on, folks, that the impossible could be possible. And so when you talk about things like climate change, We've learned at the National Pork Board through our consumer research that that is a very polarizing topic. You're either for or you're against. It's real or it's not. It's left or it's right. It's black or it's white. But if you talk about sustainability, hey, I can get around that. So when you talk about environmental concerns, whatever those may be, because it used to be a theory in people's mind due to COVID, that's helped say, is that maybe a theory that could be true? So we need to think about that. The other thing is, is it created the vulnerability in our supply chain that made people nervous. And so when you think about the global pandemic, you also think about the way the pork processing supply chain was viewed as well. Okay. Now, the minds in this room, we know how they work. We understand the health and safety and the regulation. To the normal consumer, though, that looks a little bit different. I'm going to give you a tangible example here in a moment. Digital first is not going away. For you young people in the room, it's amazing to me as I watch you and towards the end of my career on campus, I was really worried about your future state because you would walk across campus like this. And I'd be like, I hope they don't hit that oh pole right there, right? Now, I'm being facetious, but for us middle-aged folks in the room, the new eater says it's got to live in the digital space. I need to understand the information, understand how it's made, understand if I'm going to feel good about making that purchase, and is it good for me and is it good for my family? And... COVID provided a great opportunity for us to say, man, I like going to restaurants. I like going through drive throughs Pizza night, Friday night's cool, but hey, we can cook and have a family discussion still too. So what we saw was a big intake on what are recipes? How do I cook pork? 
I had an interesting experience, tangible example. We have a small pork business where we do a direct to consumer business, made a delivery in Des Moines. Gentleman bought a $250 worth of pork for Father's Day and I brought it to him at his front door. He was so excited, he's like, this is cool, I have no idea what to do with it though. And I'm like, what? He said, well, my wife bought me this for Father's Day and I'm excited, I got a new smoker. And I know how to run the smoker, but how do I use this product? I'm like, oh, you're talking to the microwave guy here, right? I'm like, <laughs> Tara Kaysen, phone a friend. Walk him through this, right? But this gentleman was probably my age, mid 40s, need to learn how to cook. That's a reality for us. Now, let's talk about this spotlight on working conditions. I'm gonna give you a tangible example. We at the National Pork Board, as of late, have been doing some consumer research through a third party that has gathered a group of consumers that identify with a certain badge value. I'll talk about that here in a minute. And that badge value, then we segment them, and then we walk into a digital space and we ask them questions that they can type on their computer, and then we break out into the Zoom rooms, okay? So badge value, they identified as either a flexitarian or a heavy pork user, and also then a heavy pork user in a rural community three different segments of consumers. And what we did is, as staff, we had the opportunity, certain staff, to log on at six o'clock at night, watch these consumer panels take place, and log off at nine o'clock. But I was coached heavily, Dr. Kaysen, your job is to keep your camera off and stay on mute and observe. Cool, I can do that. I did that real well for about five minutes. Never took off the camera, or never turned on the camera, never came off mute, but I wanted to climb through the computer. My family's like, what is wrong with you? A tangible example is this. Of that consumer group of the heavy pork users, when they started to ask questions like, well, what are your hesitations about buying pork? You're in, you're all in, you say you'll be in, but do you have any hesitations? The dialogue started and said, I worry about those big, nasty packing plants. Well, tell us more about that. What does that mean, third party facilitator? Well, there's no regulation. There's no oversight. They're dirty. They're filthy. They're packing those people shoulder to shoulder, and I'm worried about the pandemic creating a food safety issue for me and my family. Truth, within the last three weeks. Now, these are heavy users of pork. They're all in. Can you imagine me sitting in my chair in my home office? I'm wanting to climb through the camera and say, it's not true, right? Just say no. The reality is that's what they thought. And sometimes what they think is reality, and that looks like an opportunity for us, right? how we get there and be a solve, we need to walk through that. So, a couple critical conversations that are taking place that I wanna set the landscape for you so you're aware of. Europeans farm to fork strategy, I challenge you and encourage you to read it, study it, and understand it. They think it's the path forward to save the world. They also encourage the United States to move this way. Be very, very careful here, and here's why. Even though they think they're doing well for the environment, they're taking away some of those tools that we're passionate about to create efficiency of production. Actually, their Green New Deal, in my professional opinion, takes us backwards in technology and takes us backwards in innovative thinking to save the world. Now you may say, well, Brett, that's in Europe. If you really study and you understand the food state space, it really starts there, and then what happens? it tends to make its way to our shores. So I'm not saying we're for this. I'm not saying we're against it. That's not the discussion today. Today, what I want you to be is be aware that organic farming, animal welfare, pesticides, antimicrobials, and commercial fertilizer are a down arrow in that deal. I would argue you take those tools away from the American farmer, we're not sustainable because there's not a business case. And don't forget that sustainability is efficiency. If we're not efficient, we're not sustainable. If we're not profitable, we're not sustainable. So keep that on your radar, something to watch. This is a big one coming up in July, the United Nations Food System Summit. For you students in the room, I'm sure you've been talking about this at your academic institutions, but really what the UN has said is, we have set a framework for the world to follow and we're gonna drive towards an outcome. And we're gonna talk about that framework here in a moment. Food systems play a central role in building a fairer, more sustainable world, and the key is for them to develop a healthier, more sustainable, equitable food system. That's the mission. Now, we can argue if you're UN friend or foe, but this is the global framework in which the world is going to in the food system. So we need to be aware. 
What I want you to know in the slide I'm going to show you here in a minute, there is a path forward. And 72% of the global companies in this world are using the UN SDGs. So what are the UN SDGs? You can Google it, look it up, there they are. Very bright, colorful slide with intention. So UN leaders and leaders all across the globe in high-powered places have said this is the roadmap to success by 2030. So as you take a gaze and you look in here, I don't want you to be overwhelmed. What I see beyond a lot of colors and numbers is I see opportunity for pork. So if we look at goal number one, by 2030, the UN aspires to have no poverty in this world. Does pork play a role to a solution? Absolutely. Goal number two, we aspire that there's zero hunger across the world. Does pork play a role? Absolutely it does. What about climate action, 13? And there's KPIs within that. Does pork play a role? Absolutely it does. We're part of the solution. So what I want you to know that those 17 UN SDGs is the framework moving forward for the world and what we've done with your checkoff dollars at the National Pork Board is we've taken the We Care Ethical Principles, which is the sustainability framework for U.S. pork, and we've laddered up those goals and metrics that our board of directors approved in March to be able to show progress towards the UN SDGs 17. That was with intention. If we're going to be the global protein of choice, we've got to be able to demonstrate our commitment to continuous improvement. So I'd ask you to study deeper. Also, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, November 1, 2021. They're hosting a farm to fork dialogue to discuss food and climate change and food policy. What we're doing on your behalf is I believe that this should be on leaders. It should be those that make a difference, and that's called farmers. So if you're trying to change, modify, improve, use the word you want, the food system, I think it's important that those that make the food should be part of the dialogue. And that's not always welcomed, so you know. But if you know the right people in the right places, you can get in, and that's our goal. So let's talk about the customer for a moment. Let's take it from a global perspective down to the customer. Kroger's Simple Truth brand, including plant-based products, is to be, with a B, billion dollars in annual sales. So retailers say there's a business case to sustainability. When you say two with a B, that's a lot of money. So they're all in. Walmart, hopefully you've heard of their gigaton project, where they want to take a gigaton of CO2 equivalent out of the atmosphere by 2030. Now, how much is a gigaton? Anybody know? Let's make it easy. It's a lot. Can we agree? Right? Sounds like a big number, right, Mike? And you can do the math and we can show you what a gigaton is. But how is Walmart going to get there? How are they going to reach their goal? Any ideas? From their suppliers, right? They can only own so much within store. There's only so many LED lights you can put in the store. There's only so many cardboard boxes you can recycle. Then what do you have to do? You have to go to your suppliers. Are we suppliers to the biggest retail brand in the world? Yes, we are. Are they going to be asking us questions on how that pork chop can impact the reduction of a gigaton of CO2 equivalent? Yes. So some of you may be sitting there going, now this feels scary. And I would respect that, and you should be a little bit nervous, but the reality is the Sustainability Consortium, which the Pork Checkoff is a member of, that pays $25,000 of your checkoff dollars every year to have a seat at, has already created KPIs for pork for Walmart. Some of you packers in the room have got that survey in the past, and you'll say, boy, Brett, it's hard to uh, fill out. And at times, I would just leave it blank because it doesn't make sense for our business. For example, KPI number one. Help me understand how your pork supply chain is impacting deforestation in the Amazon. So if I'm a pig farmer and I get that survey in the mail, what do I do? N-A, <laughs> right? So the strategy moving forward team to support Kroger and their capital investments and support Walmart in their gigaton project is, let us draw the roadmap of what those KPIs should be. Why not build a sustainable roadmap from the ground up, or what I like to say, Rural Route 2 up, or Gravel Road up, that says this is pig farmer's voice. We understand pig farming better than anybody in the world. We understand our product better than anybody, and here's what we commit to. And that's exactly what your National Pork Board Board of Directors did in March. They took a framework 
that was built by them through a farmer's voice to demonstrate their commitments. We won't have time to talk about that today, but I'm happy to visit with you more in depth moving forward. So what's the future of products here? Even though sustainably marketed products are 16.1% of the market, they delivered 54.7% of CPG growth between 2015 and 2019. So it may not be big today, but the growth is a trajectory that people are looking at. And so what I'm receiving questions for, as I did from one of our big quick service restaurants this morning before, or this afternoon before I came into this meeting and said, Brett, how does pork play a role in our sustainable sourced pork products? And how do we brand it? How do we merchandise it? How do we market it? But more importantly, how do we prove that it is? Right? How do we prove that it is? So what I want to share with you is there was a time where you would see these big companies make commitments and throw goals out all over the place on various topics, and it was celebrated, right? Some of it was celebrated by what I would consider foes to our industry, but some of it was celebrated by the final person buying the product, but now they're taking it a step further. It's no longer just good enough to say we've set a goal. What are they asking for now? Show me, show me, show me. Those of you in the room from Missouri, if there's anybody, the Missouri, show me, right? Or what I like to call trust, but verify. Or as my grandpa taught me growing up in the West with our cow herd, right? Trust everybody, but brand your calves, <laughs> right? Same thing here. I trust you, but verify. So our opportunities to pig farmers, I mentioned this earlier, is change is happening. We must join in the conversation. Folks, we can wrestle this sustainability term all we want. We can debate it back and forth. The horse is out of the barn. You're not going to unring that bell. It's done. It's going. It's there, right? And those of you that follow big media, small media, your local media know that that's the case. So let's join the conversation. The challenge for us is this, and it's just not true. In some people's eyes, we're viewed part of the problem as opposed to part of the solution. So a snapshot of a few headlines. Burning pig poop fumes doesn't solve anything. Agriculture runoff puts Iowa's Raccoon River on a list of the 10 most endangered nationally groups, says. Get rid of red meat to help your heart study. These are two weeks, three weeks old. I'm sure there's some from today. So what's frustrating about this, and I know you're frustrated too, is, okay, you may not appreciate our manure management systems when it comes to lagoons, so we're going to create methane digesters to help with that, and then that's not good enough. That gets frustrating, doesn't it? It gets frustrating for me too, because they continue to ask, they continue to ask, you continue to deliver, and they continue to ask. I'm sorry, and I'm going to be bold, and it may not be popular, I think they're going to continue to ask. Some of this is noise, some of this is heresy, and there's a 10% you will never move. They are not movable. They've anchored in, they do not appreciate pork production no matter where they live, and they'll never like pork. I'm not going to talk to them, I'm not interested. The 10% there that's all in, right? They over-index the other way, like build more pig farms, eat more pork. The other thing that consumer panel taught me, I could do marketing, just build the pig out of bacon, we all win, right? It's over. <laughs> we're all in, that 10%. But what we are really got to focus on, team, is what I call that movable middle. Because it was interesting to watch that consumer group, no matter how they identified as their badge, right? So some people wear a badge on their, their clothing, Under Armour, right? You're riding for that brand. Some ride for Ralph Lauren and some for Nike. That means something to them. Same thing with the modern day eater. If I say I'm a flexitarian, that's part of who I am. It defines the people I hang out with. Guess what these eaters are asking for? Permission. Permission to feel good about consuming the product that you folks produce. Now I wake up in the morning and say, well, why do you need permission? <laughs> It's fantastic. It's raised appropriately. It's priced appropriately. You have a great eating experience. Why do, why do you need permission? I'm just telling you it's the new eater way. And those conversations are had around the table on, you're a flexitarian? Oh, that's cool. Tell me more because I am too. You with me? And so we've got to give them permission to enjoy the product. So we can build our credibility as part of the solution, which I'm interested in as a leader of 60 plus thousand pig farmers. I think that's the role of the checkoff is to lead and have vision and find shared values, right? And we are positioned to win for several reasons. Today, with the best modeling we have available, and it has holes, but today, when you look at the proteins, our GHG emissions are low. 
We have less of an issue there than some of our competitive proteins. But can we get better? Yes, we've proven with science, and if you look at the University of Arkansas work that we did from 1960 to 2015, we can take credit for reducing our emissions, our energy use, our land use, and our water use. We've done better. We continue to get better. Oh, the, oh by the way, for you producers in the room, isn't there a business case? Absolutely there's a business case. If you reduce water use on their farm, that's a business case. If you reduce energy use on your farm, that's a business case. If you utilize manure in a row crop field and displace commercial fertilizer use, that's a business case, right? So what I want you to know is we're not trying to lose sight of as we do this in conjunction with you as producers and scientists, that we're remembering as we anchor in these goals, metrics, and KPIs, if it doesn't help make you money, save you money, or save you time, we shouldn't be doing it, okay? So there's gotta be a business case. So we've proven that we're a low emitter. We've gotta get better. We've proven that we're a lean quality affordable protein. By the way, I think this is one of our best kept secrets and shame on me for not amplifying it earlier in my career at the checkoff. I think we're so good at what we do, sometimes we don't brag about it. Our next evolution, in my opinion, team, as checkoff paying individuals in the room, is to elevate and highlight how pork provides health and wellness for you, your family, your communities in the world. Health and wellness, that goes beyond nutrition. We already talked about our low environmental impact. And the other thing is, a lot of this starts with soil health. So here's our challenge as pork. I just bragged about we've reduced our land use and we've reduced our greenhouse gas emissions, right? Should we take credit for all that? Yeah. Can we? No. <laughs> Who helped us? Who helped us? Crop farmer, right? The row crop farmer helped us get there. How? More bushels per acre, less inputs. There's a lot of things that go into the equation, right? But here's part of that solution piece again. Think about the largest emitters in the United States of America relative to greenhouse gases. Go to the EPA website and what does it say? Industry and transportation are your big emitters, right? So I like to talk about is smokestacks and tailpipes. When you've emitted that, it's hard to unring that bell or get that solution for. We are a very small part of those emissions, depending on the data set you look at, 10% maybe is agriculture. But guess what? We can turn around and what? Sink some of that carbon. Sink some of that CO2. Once it's out of the tailpipe of the Duramax that I drove up here, it's out. But once it's out the back end of a pig, what do we do? We take that manure, we incorporate it back into the soil, and we plant corn and soybeans back into it and the cycle starts over. It's a huge advantage to us. And we know, and data suggests and has proven, that if we use pig manure appropriately, no matter what the soil type, we increase organic matter in those soils as opposed to commercial fertilizer at a faster rate. And if we do that, what happens? We keep the water where it should go, right? Instead of running off, we keep the nitrogen where it should be and we can actually sequester carbon. So that's a huge opportunity for us. Now, the challenge is, relative to soil health, we're needing partners and we need help. And that's where National Corn Growers Association and the United Soybean Board have to be next to us together on this mission. So change is happening now and we are taking action. I'm gonna give you a couple prime examples. I already talked about the Sustainability Consortium. Think about that as the uh, KPIs and indicators for Walmart currently. What in the world, Brett, does WBCSD stand for on the left-hand side of the slide? Study this, please dig in and understand the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. The World Business Council for Sustainable Development. That group is made up of 200 of the largest, most powerful CEOs in the world. Interestingly enough, thank goodness, that we have a good relationship with the North American Meat Institute, their CEO and also their VP of Sustainability. And I get a call from their VP of Sustainability at NAMI and says, did you know that World Business Council for Sustainable Development is starting a responsible protein initiative? No, I didn't, tell me more. And what I learned is these 200 global CEOs to protect, it's just business, Mike, right? It's just business to protect their business said, we've got to do something around responsible meat production around the world. And we're going to build a framework. And we're going to show them the way. And oh, by the way, underneath that responsible pork, uh, protein framework is a responsible pork initiative framework. And we're going to show them the way. 
Well, I'm fortunate enough that we were able to get a hold of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, present the framework that our board of directors approved in March, and the people on this advisory board that are building this pork protein initiative sat back and said, whoa, you folks have got a lot of this figured out. And I said, we're not perfect, but we are progressive. And the next comment that was made is said, wow, does it make sense if we would just adopt this framework, this goals, these set of metrics, and this KPI? And I said, this gentleman's in Denmark. We're having the conversation. I wish I could have hugged him through the... I said, we would really appreciate that. Now, are we going to get everything we want relative to this group? Probably not. Are they going to adopt a lot of what we've built? I think so. The good news is, and this is not to brag, you should be excited as producers and scientists, the National Pork Board now has a member of the advisory board for. Now, some would say, well, why are you hanging out with those folks? Because I'd rather be at the table than on the table. Okay, that's important. So we're taking action. Obviously, there's more to do to build our credibility. You know the challenges that are facing us. But I do want to challenge you on this statement. Let's move from no because to yes if. And this is my challenge as a 46-year-old agriculturist that grew up in the livestock business my whole life. I'm passionate about it, spent my whole career in it. But I think it's time for a new idea from a leadership perspective that a first initial reaction isn't always this. Fight. Right? Fight. And I love to fight. I love to compete and I love to win, by the way. But if we re rewind the clock, clock and look how that's helped us, have we won? I'll let you figure that out, right? I'm from Madison County, birthplace of John Wayne. He was famous for kicking down the door and firing off the six gun, right? I'm a fan. Doesn't work in today's business place. The new way of doing business in this space is you have goals, initiatives, and you have an agenda. We do too, right? How do we meet at the table and land on shared values? That's the path forward. So we're not going to agree to everything. But yes, if you maybe adopt some of the U.S. Sustainability Framework World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Does that make sense? And so I challenge you young leaders in the room, that's the future. I'm going to wrap it up and land on this one. What's the formula of success for pork? Some of this should be review. Six We Care Ethical Principles, over a decade old, 13 years. Total credit to Dallas Hockman to be the father of that, to design that. He was ahead of his time. One of the first things I was asked to do my first year on staff at the National Pork Board was get a group of producers together and see if we care still relevant. Not only did they say it was relevant, they said it's an anchor and ramp it up. So those we care principles, six of those, I like to think of those as our values. That's who we are, right? We combine those with what you folks do on the farm every day, which is called your practices. I've worked in a lot of different proteins, the dairy industry, the beef cattle industry, the pig industry. What I love most about pig farmers is you're progressive. And although we don't always get along, we're way more united than some others not to be named. <coughs> beef, right? <laughs> Excuse me. We can more so unite and move farther faster. And we're going to get better there, right? Ultimately, and this picture is not just as a placeholder, what we're trying to garner, folks, here is public trust or permission to eat. And that picture defines what's your new eater. It is this young mom with young child on hip with a digital piece in her hand saying, tell me more about what you're producing and why it's good for me and good for my family. I think this equation works. My evaluation says this today is our weak point. We can't just take the old way of standing in front of people and say we care and we're committed to continuous improvement. It worked 13 years ago. The marketplace has said, now, I know you care, but prove it. Or trust, but verify. And that's a scary place, because that means using data, right? And that's a discussion for a different day for a different conference. Thank you. And so we are really today viewed in some people's mind as the protein of choice around the world, because they consume it. They buy a lot of it, right? But the key is, will we become the valued, sustainable protein of choice? Because there's others trying to put their stake out there to say they are. And it's our job to say, we're not going to disparage you. Don't believe in that. But what I do believe is, my job for you is to be an advocate for on how we 
should be and could be and are moving towards the sustainable protein of choice without disparaging. So with that, we've got about five minutes left, I think, Colin. And if it's okay with you, we'll entertain any questions the group may have. Thank you for your attention. Thank <clears throat>